Kim Longinato is a director who typically focuses on women on the fringes of society on a global scale, working almost exclusively in documentary to showcase women around the world who stand up and stand out. In the past, she has covered women in Iran seeking divorce in 1998's Divorce Iranian Style, women in South Africa running a group to help abandoned and abused children in 2008's Rough Aunties, and most recently, a former prostitute in Chicago looking to help young women not take the same path she took with 2015's Dreamcatcher. Kim Longinato grew up in England, where she attended an all-girls boarding school, at which the headmaster commanded that the other students not speak to her for a term following her getting lost on a school trip. However, this silence continued for several years. Later, she found herself unemployed and homeless, becoming ill as she lived on the streets. She briefly studied English and European literature at Essex University before attending the National Film and Television School in London. Here, she picked up a handheld camera, her staple to this day, and began a now lifelong career as a documentary filmmaker. This film was co-directed by Jano Williams, who lived in Japan from 1974 until 1988, where she worked for the NHK, Japan's biggest broadcasting corporation, as well as contributing to newspapers and magazines. The center of her writing was the everyday lives of Japanese citizens, which provided an appropriate background to working on something like today's film, Shinjuku Boys, a portrait of a group of young people who were assigned as women at birth, but in one way or another have rejected this identity as they have grown up. One need look no further than co-director Kim Longinato's own statement on her documentary subjects to explain why she chose to make a film about such a subject when the LGBT plus community was still considered fringe. Because I'm really quite a insecure, fearful person in a way. I think that's why I film rebels and people that are changing the world and brave people. In a way, I make the films about people I would love to be like. You know. This group is known colloquially as Onabe, a term which originally meant lesbian, but underwent changes throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, arriving at its current definition as someone who is born female and lives as a man. The term is almost synonymous, it seems, with the typical line of work that Onabe pursue, which is that of a host, most commonly in Shinjuku, Tokyo, where today's film was shot. Shinjuku is a ward within Tokyo known for its entertainment, business, and shopping venues. The district alone boasts a population of over 330,000. You might remember us discussing Shinjuku Station back in the Suicide Club review. This station holds a special significance as the most heavily trafficked subway station in the entire world. Shinjuku Nichome is an area within the district that is known as the hub of gay clubs and bars in Tokyo. Following the passage of the anti-prostitution law in 1956, discussed in our episode on Sun in the Last Days of the Shogunate, the brothels which had called Shinjuku Nichome home began to dry up, and were steadily replaced by gay bars. There had been an LGBT presence in the area since the Americans had occupied Japan some ten years prior. But with the space available as prostitution was steadily pushed out in a formal sense, the gay community was able to expand. Almost every major event since then in Japan's LGBT saga has occurred within Shinjuku Nichome, including the first Pride Parade in Japan and the first LGBT center in Japan. It's also the home of Tokyo's International Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. In 2014, Akie Abe, wife of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, attended Tokyo Rainbow Pride, one of Tokyo's two current Pride Parades, showing that attitudes may be changing toward the LGBT community within the country. With such a dense population, then, it is only logical that as Shinjuku ni Chome blossomed into a sort of gay promised land, that the community began to expand its reach as well. Clubs exist alongside one another in this environment catering to bara, or muscle worship, bear clubs, BDSM clubs, you name it. In such a dense world, it pays to stand out, and the key is maintaining customers. These pocket communities exist to fill niche lifestyles and interests, 
But there is only so much demand, thanks purely to the statistics of population, meaning that these clubs are usually rather small compared to what a traveler from another major city might be expecting. One of the popular types of clubs in Shinjuku Nichome is the host club. Hosting, or hostessing in the female equivalent, is something like the modern iteration of the geisha. Employees are more or less paid to entertain, to keep conversation, and to drink with customers, generally of the opposite sex. The shamisen and singing of the geisha have since been replaced by karaoke and easy conversation, where the host assumes the character their customer wants to date. As such, hostess clubs seem like the natural evolution from the geisha. Mark Guthrie, writing for Gaijinpot, explains that the general customers of hostess clubs are lonely men who are very wealthy, and who use hostess clubs as a means of relieving societal stress, both from their jobs and from their inability to speak with women casually. I suspect that the same could be said of host clubs, where women go to relieve the stresses of work or school, and to converse with men who have no bearing on their personal life unless they decide that they should. While hostessing can be traced back to geisha, host clubs go back only to 1966, when the first such club was opened in Tokyo. Onabe clubs actually didn't originate in Shinjuku though. The first Onabe club opened in Ropongi, a district in Minato, Tokyo, in 1973. So, by standards contemporary to the film, we're seeing a relatively young scene, only 22 or 23 years old at the time of filming. Just keep that in mind as we get into the film here. As usual, if you haven't seen it, we highly recommend going and checking out Shinjuku Boys, as it is a fascinating time capsule of Tokyo, the LGBT scene, and the mid-1990s. We'll be discussing more in depth the implications of what is talked about in the film, so while it's not necessary to have seen it, we definitely recommend it. Plus, it's less than an hour long, so it's not like it's going to take that much time out of your day. The film showcases a diverse perspective into the lives of those living on the fringes of society. First, you have Gaish, who states at one point that he doesn't see himself as a man, nor as a woman. Then there's Kazuki, who seems to be more comfortable in a stricter male persona, as dictated by Japanese social standards, yet he has no interest in hormone therapy. Lastly, there's Tatsu, who we learn right from the beginning is undergoing hormone therapy. He's been getting testosterone injections, which is evident by the deepening of his voice compared to the other two Onabe. Throughout the film, we follow these three young men in their personal lives, as well as their jobs as hosts at Club Marilyn, in Onabe Bar in Shinjuku Nichome. Of particular note throughout the film is how the Onabe refer to the expectations and expressions of the male and female genders. Tatsu talks about the importance of clothing removal and full physical intimacy for women during sexual contact a sentiment echoed by Gaish. Repeatedly, they talk about being colder and more detached as men than when they were younger and living as women. Gaish goes as far as to explain his bad boy attitude. He's mean to the girls he hosts, yet he still brings them back, since they enjoy the hardship. What's more, we explore their personal relationships within and outside of Club Marilyn. Gaish, we learn, is not in a long-term relationship. Personal romance outside of the club is frowned upon, as is common practice in hosting. Throughout the film, we see him answer multiple calls and have several meetings with different clients, almost all of whom he talks to about how many women he is sleeping with at the time. His persona is more brash than Kazuki's or Tatsu's, and it shows in his expression of sex as well. Gaish explains in a one-on-one -on -one interview that, since he isn't 100% sure of his specific gender, presenting himself as male for his job is like putting on a show, which in turn encourages the audience to ask what parts of our gender expression we see reflected in these men. For the others, however, breaking the taboo of long-term relationships isn't really an issue. Later in the film, we meet the partners of the other two Onabe, providing insight into the diversity within their sex lives and orientations. Kazuki is dating a trans woman who works as a dancer at another Shinjuku club. Tatsu, on the other hand, is dating a cisgender woman, whom he says is the first person to make him truly feel comfortable with being nude. <laughs> Thank you.
The film also explores how, aside from simply paying attention to the customers and making them feel wanted, every club has their own, very precise method of doing everything. We see how grueling and exacting the host industry can be when we briefly follow a new employee at Club Marilyn. There is not only a physical expectation, as seen in the older hosts telling the newbie to let his hair grow out slightly, but also high standards of service. We see this through how meticulously they explain the intricacies of drink pouring and social interaction with the women they're hosting. This is important as we learn that a host's salary is usually supplemented by commission that comes from how many drinks a regular customer will buy during her visit. Typically, the bar will split the cost of said drinks, meaning that there is a pressure for hosts to keep guests entertained and drinking for longer periods. On a customer's first visit, they are visited by the hosts on staff in rotation and are made to pay a relatively small fee. However, when they return and become regular customers, they are asked to pick their favorite host, who they'll visit regularly. From that point on, the visiting fee is increased and the drink commission can begin. It's all a very complicated system, the implications of which this film explores. One of the most notable things about Shinjuku boys is the frankness with which the Onabe speak about their lives, both professional and private. It would seem that living in such an accepting environment, around similar and like-minded people, they are incredibly relaxed in speaking about sex, gender dysphoria, and acting as it relates to their jobs. But perhaps that's how Shinjuku works for its LGBT residents, with the Onabe being a microcosm of being gay in Japan. They are actors, whether to family members or to society as a whole, pretending to be heterosexual in some public capacities, while they have a big enough support network within their home of Shinjuku, so that when there's no need for the mask, they can easily discard it. Their daily persona and their professional persona are different, one being an actor and one a character. This makes Shinjuku boys almost allegorical for the state of LGBT society in Japan as a whole, at least in the mid-1990s. The most unsure of these actors, though, is Kazuki, which we can glean from the fact that, rather than confront or lie to his mother, he has simply not spoken to her in five years. On Mother's Day, during filming, he sends her a bouquet of flowers and calls her in the evening. Partway through the scene, he abruptly tells her that his girlfriend is transgender, then goes on to say, quote, I'm the same, end quote. We can see at this point how he nervously pulls at his cigarette and begins to shake. This interaction is the culmination of the Kazuki's two existences colliding, how he presents himself with his mother and how he presents himself to his customers. I adore Shinjuku boys personally, if only because it exists as a testament to a time that has long passed, in a landscape that is ever-changing and ever-evolving. Documentary is important for this reason, as fictional narratives can offer fresh perspectives on past times, or different interpretations of events or ideas, but only through the type of filmmaking employed here can we get a relatively unadulterated peek into the lives of the past. Earlier in life, co-director Kim Longinato was interested in storytelling, potentially fiction, but decided instead to opt for the documentary format due to the events of her life at the time. The style Longinato employs is known commonly as cinema verite, or literally, truthful cinema in French. And if I pronounce that wrong, I apologize, I don't speak French, this is a Japanese show, this is an American show. Also called observational filmmaking, it's a style which forgoes higher gloss techniques common among documentaries like pre-plotting, major editing, or the insertion of the filmmaker into the narrative. This is made evident when you consider that Longinato is the woman literally behind the camera, but we never see or meet her. It's not her story, and she's not even the one telling it. In an article published by The Guardian, Longinato went into detail about this, explaining, quote, I want you to forget me, so there is nothing between you and them. So it looks like a fiction film. Everywhere I go, I have never had a film which people didn't want to be in." End quote. This principle leads to a more raw, personal form of storytelling by admitting that the film is a film and not trying to trick the audience into thinking that it is a truthful narrative despite the heavy edits of a documentary trying to convey a message or a bias rather than simply a story. We are given a very pure depiction of what these men experience in their lives. 
Though there is a narrator for Shinjuku Boys, she only ever delivers basic information perhaps not easily distinguished by the audience, such as how long the couple shown in the film have been together. Yet the majority of the information is conveyed through the Onabe's actions and words, with narration being sparse throughout. This echoes Longinato's thoughts regarding one of her later projects, titled Hold Me Tight, Let Me Go, which offered a candid view into a school for emotionally disturbed children who are counseled with patience rather than discipline. In an interview with, well, Interview Magazine, Longinato explained that she never plans her films out, and simply shoots, following the characters and actions as they develop themselves. Jana Williams, in addition to co-directing, was usually the translator on staff for Longinato's Japan-based films, of which they made four together. Her first husband had been Japanese, and she speaks the language, but Longinato commented in an interview that she believes it was Williams' being an outsider to the culture that helped the documentary subjects be so relaxed in speaking with her. Longinato explains that someone from a culture will be more forgiving of a foreigner not understanding social mores, or of speaking improperly if their language proficiency is not at a native level. As the film is 20 years old at this point, you may be wondering how things have changed in the LGBT plus community within Japan since filming took place. Well, in 2002, a law was introduced allowing transgender individuals in Japan to legally change their gender following sexual reassignment surgery, among other stipulations, thus allowing straight transgender people who have had sexual realignment surgery to marry their partners. Unfortunately, this means that gay transgender individuals still have no marriage protection, nor do those with opposite sex partners not interested in SRS. Further complicating the issue in more recent years is the fact that, since 2009, Japan has allowed its citizens to enter into same-sex marriages in countries where same-sex marriage is legal. But officially, this does not mean that they are married within Japan, as, legally, the country's constitution speaks of marriage being based on the mutual consent of both sexes. Some see this as a sign of a slow move toward legalizing gay marriage within Japan, but for the time being, it presents a legally dubious issue. Japan does not allow for dual citizenship. It hasn't since the 1980s. If you were born in Japan as a citizen, and wanted to, say, move to America to marry a same-sex partner, you would not only have to go through the process of gaining citizenship in this other country, but you would also have to renounce your Japanese citizenship. Thus, there is a little compromise, though the wheels of change seem to slowly be moving. In recent years, things seem to have been further improving, with more celebrities coming forward as gay, lesbian, or transgender. In 2003, Aya Kamikawa ran for and was elected to the assembly of Setagaya Ward of Tokyo, which is the body that governs a ward of Tokyo alongside its mayor. This made her the first openly transgender government official in the country. More recently, in early 2017, Japan became the first country to elect an openly transgender male politician, Tomoya Hosoda, who now sits as a counselor in the city of Iruma. However, disproportionately, the celebrities covered by the media are either gay men or male to female transgender which is not dissimilar to how gay and trans people within other developed nations are seen. Just as in America, the stories of trans men, and those who refute the gender binary, like those seen in Shinjuku Boys, are often overlooked. Shinjuku Boys is an important film, both for Japanese cinema and for LGBT cinema, because it shows us a time when all of this was still ahead of the Japanese LGBT movement. The 90s were a time of great upheaval in terms of public image for the community, at least within Tokyo, with Shinjuku housing several advancements discussed before in terms of visibility. It was a less ambiguous time, legally speaking, and this shows in how resolute or destitute our various hosts seem when speaking about their situations. If you're interested in seeing Shinjuku Boys, because, believe us, it might only be an hour long but there's a lot to see in it, and we've only really talked about the subtext here. Currently, the British company's second-run DVD offers the film on Region 2 DVD, packaged with Gaia Girls, another Longinato Williams collaboration detailing female pro wrestling in Japan. It's a reasonable price on the site, at about 13 British pounds or something like 16 US dollars as of this writing, but unfortunately there isn't an easily accessible version in North America. If you have the chance, be sure to check out Shinjuku Boys. Let us know in the comments below what you think of it, and what other Japanese LGBT films you'd like to see covered here on the show. 